What's going on, my people? Welcome to another episode of the Urban Wall Street Project. I'm your host, Earl Christian III. And today we're going to talk about something that everybody's talking about around the globe, the $700 billion bailout. The government came to the aid of a lot of these corporations who have made a lot of money, and have built a lot of money. But we're going to talk about its effect is specifically and particularly on urban America. A lot of individuals may think that if they're not understanding what pork barrel spending in his stocks and bonds and they're not into this whole arena, that it's not going to affect them. But you better understand something. If it affects the top, it definitely affects the bottom. But we're going to get into it. So, of course, I have my confidant, my brother, who definitely keeps me on the track and, and keeps the Urban Wall Street Project on track, Mr. William R. Patterson, best-selling author, the Baron Son, as well as number one wealth coach. But without further ado, my brother, Mr. William Patterson. Well, what's good, sir? Thank you, Earl. Yes, Always sir. a pleasure to be here on yes, the Urban Wall Street Project. Yes, sir. You know what it is. So let's talk about it, man. This $700 billion bailout. A lot of people, you know, paying attention to politics, and we're hearing a lot of people talking about, you know, the politicians and pundits. You know, everybody's giving their views, but a lot of people, and for one, I don't think they really understand the language of politics. So if you're not really someone who understands the language of politics, it seems like irrespective of what you hear, it might seem like it's nothing because it's a complete barrier. So I really want to get into understanding the language because if you don't understand the language, it doesn't matter how long somebody talks about it, how often you hear them talk about it, it's not going to make sense. And that's why I really think a lot of people are not really understanding what this whole bailout situation is about. So let's talk about it, brother. Sure. Well, of course, if you're talking about the bailout, you have to look at the history that led to this condition. You also have to look at some of the longer term implications from everything from housing prices to being able to afford to go to college, being able to buy a car, being able to start a business. All of these things are affected by this bailout package and really a lot of the decisions and lack of regulation and oversight that's been happening on Wall Street. Right, right. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm so, it's just so amazing, man, that we're at this situation. $700 billion is a lot of money. Now, I say all the time, in relation to the spending for urban America, you know, African Americans and Latinos, we spend $1.2 trillion annually. So that's a lot of money that we spend in our communities, pretty much on all depreciable things. So when you see $700 billion, yes, it is still a lot of money. It's not as much as we spend annually, but that's a lot of money that the taxpayers are going to have to pay. And we really got to understand it, because a lot of people question, Seems like some crimes have been committed. Seems like some people should be held accountable. You know, I see the government blames the, the corporations, the corporations blame whoever the case may be, and the little man loses. So $700 billion, individuals in urban America, small businesses, individuals um, in college, people that maybe not have degrees trying to get jobs. Because I know the trickle-down effect is serious. Unemployment is high. I mean, a variety of other things are going down in addition to this, uh, this campaign race that we have going on. But when you really talk about it, what do you think led to this $700 billion bailout, the whole situation, and in layman terms, because, you know, even if you just watch CNN and they might not get it, I want to give it to my people, real layman, real urban, so they can understand just what it means for them. Absolutely. Well, there were a lot of converging risks that led to this situation. You have everything from a crisis in the subprime credit market. For people who may not be familiar with the subprime market, what that means is people who are considered more challenged credit borrowers, people who may have some late payments, may have bankruptcies, may have foreclosures, they are lent money at a different rate, which is typically a higher rate. You also had a lot of people who were given adjustable rate mortgages who weren't equipped to handle the rise in payment that came once that rate adjusted. With an adjustable rate mortgage, you come out and they say, well, your rate will start out at 5% and then it will rise up to a certain cap. But a lot of people, when they got into that house, they really couldn't afford it to begin with. And you had a lot of mortgage brokers, you had a lot of real estate agents that said, buy more house. The real estate market is, is jumping at 20, 30, 50% a year right. in, in some markets. You'll always be able to refinance. So don't worry about it. Just get the house you love now. Right. In certain parts of California, they were doing what are known as negative amortization loans. So let's say it was a million dollar home. And the, the payments, let's say, might have been $6,000 on that home. Okay. And they said, well, how much can you afford to pay? You say, 3000 Right. At that point, they say, okay, we'll give you the mortgage for $3,000. We'll tack the other 3000 onto the principal. So mm. after the first month, instead of owing 100000 you owe 103000 After the second month, you owe 106000 Wow. They did that up to you owed 25% uh, more than the loan you took out. So you, took, you started with a $1 million loan, and you end up with a 
$1.25 million wow, loan. Wow, that's amazing. So if you couldn't afford to pay for the million dollar loan, obviously you couldn't afford to pay for the $1.25 right, million Right, and thus the interest on $1.25 mil is greater than the interest on a million. Exactly. So it's like, your, it's like your money is compounding and growing exponentially, but out of your pocket. So in some parts of the country, foreclosures were as common as people buying a home. In some parts, you had nine foreclosures for every one home purchase. So it was really this rapid foreclosure uh, foreclosure crisis that hit the country. But one of the big things that I always like to point out when you're looking at something from the perspective of the Barron Solution, this is really what we're seeing, historic opportunities, real estate market, stock market. Definitely. The, if you're a person who's very close to retirement within 15 years, this is going to be a time for you to make up, or this is going to be a period where you can make up for a lot of lost time. Okay. Also, when it comes to the real estate market, home prices have dropped 20% or more in many parts of the country and are going down. If you learn how to buy these properties right, learn how to pull together cash in a syndicate, you can buy properties at deep discounts and build a lot of wealth. Mm. Now, um, you know, I was looking at, um, you know, of course, I watched the debate, you know, both, both debates, of all the debates, actually, whether it's vice president or presidential. And the one thing, you know, I don't hear anybody talk about, and as I said, it goes back to just whether or not individuals really understand the language. The whole theme of the Urban Wall Street Project is financial literacy. You know, how literate are you? And that's what comes in important because, yes, $700 billion is going to be spent. <clears throat> Excuse me, $700 is going to be costing the taxpayers. So taxpayers need to hear, oh, you're going to get your money back this way, that way. But at the end of the day, if you're really not literate, what would you do if they gave you back a $1,500 check or a $3,000 check? How are you going to change the economic practices in your home if you're not financially literate? Because the reality is everything has to be cut back. You have to cut back your spending, put a moratorium on spending, manage this, watch that. And you hear all those things. And that's all eloquent and cool for individuals who understand money and how to manage and budget it. But think about the individuals who have no clue. How, you know, how do, what, you know, what do they do? Well, I'll tell you, one of the things you want to do is to equate the federal government to your household. And just like you have a certain amount of income that, that comes in and you may have a certain amount of debt, so does the federal government. And at this point, the federal government is overextended. And they are bringing in less money than they're spending. They're running a deficit right now. And they also have a huge national debt, over $9.5 trillion yes. in national debt. So, and they're paying over $500 billion a year in interest charges alone. Now, what happens when the government has this kind of debt. They typically do one of two things. They either need to print some more money right. or, or they're, they're going to need to, to, to raise some more money, which, right. which of course is going to lead to higher inflation, which means the money that you have in your bank account is worth less. Exactly. Or they're typically going to have to raise taxes. Right. So again, this is going to eventually come back and, and hit you. The smallest estimates that we've seen for this bailout package is that it's going to cost $2,300 for every man, woman, right, child. Right, right. I definitely understood that. Now, when you look at the larger picture here, $2,300 may sound like a lot, but when you look at what's at stake in allowing a lot of these different companies to collapse, right now we have a serious crisis in the credit market where people are not able to get credit. Right. When you look at all the different aspects of your life that are affected by credit, if you can't get a loan to go to school, what does that do to your earning potential? Right. If you can't or another person can't get a loan to buy your home, that means home prices are going to go down or you might, you might not be able to sell it as quickly. When you're looking at starting a business, those businesses can't get the capital that they need to make payroll. So imagine how upset you're going to be if you show up to work and your employer says, sorry, we're a little short this week. You're, you're going to be right, upset right. or question. you get laid off. Unemployment is at a five-year high. In the African-American community, we've seen 11.4% uh, unemployment. So these are very severe unemployment numbers. And, of course, they're going to impact you. If you lose your job, it's going to cost you more than $2,300 per man, woman, and child. So really what you're looking at is infusing some more capital into the system because right now these banks are afraid to lend to each other. And if they're afraid to lend to each other, if they're afraid to lend to consumers, then it puts that freeze on the system. And of course, we all operate off of credit and just about everything we do. And, and a lot of people don't realize that in the so point that you touched upon it, because nowadays going for a job, employers can look at your credit and you can get a job or not get a job based on your credit. 
when it comes to financing, right now I was in this early stages of you know prior, pre the bailout package being approved, the way the case may be. They were just talking about how this whole market was just crunching in. If you didn't have a 720 credit score, you could forget about getting a car loan. So it got to the point where you couldn't get a car loan, a housing loan. You had individuals who were had buyers. They were selling their home and they had buyers, but the buyers couldn't couldn't close the deal out because they couldn't get finance. So it affects so many people in different ways. Now, one of the things that you know you hear him talking about is the, the the catalyst, or I should say the nucleus to this whole situation is the whole mortgage, the mortgage fiasco. And this is what I want to say to individuals when it comes to what can we do now? What can you do? A lot of times it seems like for me, when you get contracts or mortgage contracts or paperwork, a lot of that information might be lengthy. And a lot of times you see individuals, brokers or uh, real estate agents, whoever the case may be, they give you sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, initial here. Absolutely. And what do we do? It could be three or four forms. We initial, initial, sign, flip, flip, initial, initial, sign, flip, flip, initial. Have no idea what we just signed. We become so impatient or uh, uh, since a year rushed that we don't read it. So now what happens is a part of that for me would be on my fault because if I don't know what's in my contract or what does it say, then I have to be um, I have to be held accountable for that. So I think moving forward, definitely as this whole game changes, because it's going to change now. I'm looking at commercials, everything is 0%, 0%, 0%. I'm only giving things away now because that's what happens. Once something collapses, you got to build it back up. But now is a perfect opportunity for individuals who are not financially literate, have not really been understanding money. It's almost like they do, it's a do-over. Start getting financially literate now because that's what's going to help protect you as an individual household, in my opinion, if fiascos like this or as this thing goes on, because the reality is this, irrespective of who's going to be the next president, this situation is not going to go away in four years. It didn't get to the state in four years. It's not going to be fixed in four years. So it's going to be very important that individuals really, you know, start understanding the need to be financially literate. It's not about what you want anymore. You might not want to sit down and study economics. You might not want to get into accounting, but you do want to survive. You do want to be able to take care of your children. So then you need to be financially literate. It's like a necessity these days. And I want to know your opinion on that, Will. You're absolutely right. As Charles Dickens would say, it's a tale of two cities. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. You do not have to be a victim in this environment. Again, the, the, through the Barron Solution, we love this because this is like a sale. Right. When you go to any store on uh, any, any major store and they're having a, a huge sale, 50% off, 60% off, you're just smiling and laughing all the way home. But now you have a chance to do that when it comes to assets. So you can, of course, buy what are known as REOs or uh, OREOs, basically foreclosed properties that are now owned by banks you have the opportunity to play a downside of a market. We saw historic point drops mm -hmm. in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You can certainly play the downside of those markets. So we always say that if you can, well, I'll tell you, one of my quotes is, you'll never go broke underestimating the inefficiencies, incompetence, and uh, partisan politics of the U.S. government right. if you can play the downside of a market. True. Because many of them are going to do things that are in their best interest and the best interest of their constituents, and that's going to create some broader problems for the economy. And you can always learn how to play the downside of a market as well as protect yourself from major risk. When you look at the downside of many people's retirement portfolios, retirement accounts, IRAs, et cetera, they're down more than, than the $2,300 that this, this bailout is going to cost definitely, a woman child. Definitely. Your uh, illiteracy, right. it's costing you. It's right. costing you big. Yeah, it's, it's basically your lack of knowledge. Illiteracy is your lack of knowledge. So understand, so your lack of knowing something, whether you want to know it or not, your lack of knowing it, and you don't have to lack in that area. And it's not just costing you. It's not costing you just at, at the, the bank or at the store where you're spending it. It's costing your children. It's costing your future. It's costing you your free time. It's costing you the ability to be able to pursue the thing that you're most passionate about. Every time you have to get up and go to work and do something that you're not passionate about. We've moved from being a cash culture to really being a monthly payment culture. Can I afford it? Right. If I can afford it, I want the biggest car, truck, right, tank right. I can get. And sometimes if I can't afford it, I'll figure out how to make it work. Yeah, exactly. And that's what they'll tell you. Again, they'll figure out, and, and a lot of this is going to change now because, of course, Wall Street, the government is saying that you cannot continue to lend to people recklessly. Right. 
and expect to still have a business at the end of the right. day. Right, especially knowing that it's reckless and, and, and you're capitalizing on people's you know, ig ignorance and illiteracy, which, right. which is, to me should be a crime. It's like, you know, I'm robbing right. you because you don't know. That's unfortunate. Well, but at, at the same time, there, there's enough blame to go around. People certainly knew they couldn't afford the house when they got it. This is true. And that, <laughs> people and that, knew they couldn't afford the car this when, is very true. when and, they bought it. And that comes with right. that. That's a personal accountability that you have to Absolutely. know what your spending limits are and not try to keep up with the Joneses because uh, the reality is there are no such thing as Joneses. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a myth to me. But I want to talk about this because one of the um, key words, you hear it in political uh, conversations, campaigns, and people talk about it. I even hear individuals in the audience here, and they say, oh, yeah, pork, bar pork barrel spending and pork barrel spending. But here, here's my thing. How many people really sitting at home knows exactly what a pork barrel is, knows what pork barrel spending constitutes? So none of us. Exactly. None of us. I don't really know what it is. You know, it sounds something major, but we're going to understand what it is right now if you didn't know. And I don't have, have a problem. I know a lot of things, but I don't know everything. Pork barrel spending. William, what is this? So we know what to look out for in the fine print. Well, when politicians need to get a bill passed, one of the things that they do is they use the power of their vote. So as you saw when the House uh, basically voted uh, against the first bailout bill, and over $1.2 trillion flew out of the stock market, right. members of the House understood just how much power they had. And they have constituents, when they get elected to office, that say, ooh, can you put this in? Can you get us some money to do this? That's what constitutes the pork barrel spending. It's when you have a small group of constituents who have a certain interest, and you make the general population pay for that particular uh, constituents interest. An example in this bailout bill there were over a hundred and fifty uh, billion dollars added to the, the 700 right. that would give some additional tax breaks um, and some of that included some pork barrel spending. Things like tax breaks for manufacturers of wooden arrows for, right, for right. kids, so for racetracks, right. for uh, Puerto Rican and, and Virgin Island rum producers, right. for wool research. Th different things like that. They said if you want my vote you've got to stick this thing in the bill. And this happens all the time in Washington, and that's what constitutes uh, pork barrel yeah. spending. That sounds like, you know, you know, you wash my hand, mush my hand, I wash yours. It kind of sounds like, we, we have things like that in the hood, too. In urban America, things like that go down well, sometimes. Uh, get in where you fit in. Yeah, pretty much. Get in where you fit in. That's what it sounds like to me. You know what I'm saying? Right. You're buying, buying a slot or buying a spot. Right. Um, not serious. So I'm hopeful, you know, we got a little better understanding of this pork barrel spending. Um, now, is there, a way, is there a way to, uh, how do you get around pork barrel spending? Well, it's really being a part of the, the political process, and mm -hmm. it's really encouraging your, your representative to vote certain ways. And that's what you want to do. You want to exercise your right to vote, and you want to hold the people that you elect accountable. Accountability is key, and that was one of the big things that was missing from Wall Street was accountability and oversight. All right. Now, you know, I, I just have to ask this question, because, you know, we all sit at home, and we watch the TV, we watch the pundits talk, we watch the you know, campaign, we watch the, uh, uh, you know, just the candidates, and just, we just listen. And, you know, it's like everyone's saying, well, the government, you know, the government did this, or the government allowed this, or, or these companies did it. Well, it seems like every, all these corporations operate in some way, shape, or form under the jurisdiction of the government. You don't have to pay taxes. You're all accountability. There's audits. There's trial and error. There's checks and balances. But if you know, if they say, oh, Congress dropped the ball, right? Well, government, it, who is government? Isn't government Congress? Those 500 and some people that make up Congress, don't they make up the, the, the government? Well, of course you have different branches. You know. but, but they are the government, are they not? They're, they're, they're certainly part of it. Absolutely. Right, they're certainly part of it. Well, well, who's the other part? So the people on Capitol Hill, those, those congressional right. leaders, right. they're one part of the government. Who's the other right. part of the government? Well, of course you have, those are the, the federal government. And of course you have state and, and local governments right, we have as those. well. And you have, of course, the executive branch and judicial. So, you know, all of those different pieces are supposed to work together for uh, the greater good. Right. But they don't always work out that way. And, of course, when you elect people in office, you want them to do the things that are in your best interest. That's why you're voting that person in office. Right. Now, unfortunately, a lot of corporations have a lot of influence. A lot of special interest groups have their, their own interests at heart. And right. many of these corporations have become as powerful as countries. So, right. and a lot of times they operate as their own independent entity. So they don't look at themselves as quote, American businesses. They are their own country. Wow. So 
if it's cheaper for me to ship some jobs overseas, we're going to do that because that's what's in the best interest of our corporation slash country. And a lot of times, those ideals are at odds with those of the average American. So you have these people in government who are beholden to these special interest groups and these major corporations, and a lot of times that may be in direct conflict with the needs of the American people. All right. Here's a question. Basic logic. You have two people that, call, that are the primary cause of the fiasco, but then these are the same two people that we have to give billions of dollars to, hundreds of billions of dollars to, to fix it, right? Polson and Bernanke. Well, a lot of people will say this goes back much earlier, and a lot of people even blame Greenspan for keeping interest rates so low. And when you had in the late 90s, early 2000s, was, which was around the time we wrote The Barren Sun, and that was one of the reasons is because we wanted to give people an ethical roadmap for responsibly wielding power and influence. Right. And when the stock market crashed, a lot of people just immediately ran into the real estate market and created a bubble in that market. So a lot of people blame Greenspan for keeping interest rates so low, which allowed this fuel of, of builders uh, building apartments, building uh, homes, people buying homes, flipping homes, doing interest-only loans. So a lot of people directed back to Greenspan. Of course, you can't ignore the fact we had a war going on as well. So that also compounded the problem when you had uh, hundreds of billions of dollars going into Iraq and I Afghanistan to, to fund those wars. So when you have all these different pieces coming together, converging on homeowners, business owners, it certainly uh, puts a lot of pressure and you end up with job losses and foreclosures. And it, and it, and it seems like it's, um, sadly it seems like it's going to get worse before it um, actually gets better. Um, another question I had. For some, again, I, I want to point out, this is the greatest time since the Great Depression for you to build wealth if you increase your financial literacy. There you go. I, I will say that one more time. That's right. This is the greatest time in over 50 years for you to build wealth if you increase your financial literacy. There are opportunities in the real estate market, there are opportunities in the stock market, and there are opportunities in the general business economy. You can play the downside of the stock market. You can also invest in, quote, some of the recession-proof industries, right. things like the, the medical industry, things like education. People stop, don't stop getting sick, and, and people don't stop going to school. Right. Although, you know, there are some, you have to play these markets the right way, and that's why you do want to get some kind of, of coaching insight or advice to help you. Definitely, definitely. And that's very important, you know, and of course the Baron Sun offers, you know, coaching and things that they need so you can reach out to um, William, um, you know, at the end of the show or in, in, in leisure. But definitely take your diligence because uh, we are in a serious economic time and it's going to get better. Believe it, it's going to get better. Everything, you know, everything gets better. But the reality is, are you going to be able to weather that storm? Are you going to be able to sustain your household, um, you know, amidst all of that? Um, the last thing I want to ask, so now, William, you know, People are recognizing, you're seeing the numbers going up and down, and it seems like once the bailout, you know, it's approved and the money starts being allocated to the appropriate ent entities, things will start to level out. But for the people that, but it always levels out at the top, seemingly, and then it'll settle at the bottom, right? So for my people right now who are going through it, like you said, this is the, one of the best times. It can be the worst time, but if you want to look at it as opportunity, look at it like that. Somebody right now, no $25,000 a year, not too much debt, hasn't been illiterate, realize it's time to get literate, one minute, what should they do to get, start themselves off from this point right now? I'd say there's seven key things that a person wants to do. Number one, you definitely want to get some type of mentor, advisor, or coach. They're going to be able to help you avoid a lot of the hurdles and pitfalls out there. Number two, continue to expand your belief system. Understand that a lot of great things are possible and you can do anything starting from exactly where you are right now. Number three, build your network. 80% of your success is based on your ability to network and form strategic partnerships and joint ventures. Number four, you definitely want to leverage the major wealth building vehicles, stock market, real estate, and entrepreneurship. Five and six, knowledge tools. And number seven, do the most important thing every day that will change the condition of your life. Right. And also, I want you to check this out. My brother, I told you, he's one of the best-selling authors. I want you to cop his book, read his book, The Baron's Son. It's in a couple of languages. It's in Polish. It's in English. And it's been recently just done up in Korean. And just so you can get a little insight onto the book, I'm going to let my man William Patterson let you know right quickly before we get out of here what you can expect once you pick it up. 
The Barren Sun is the story of a young boy who loses everything and through struggle finds the secret to become the richest, most powerful person in the world. The book is going to show you how to tap into your passion, your great idea, get support from other people, and use that to dominate as an industry baron or baroness. So you're going to learn how to build and create your multi-million dollar business, and you'll learn some great resources on our website as well, baronseries.com. Beautiful, beautiful. Like we always say, the Urban Wall Street Project, we're in a serious situation, but you can come through it, start becoming financially literate. Understand something, financial literacy starts at home. Don't expect your children to learn it in school. Don't expect them to learn it in college. You got to start talking about it at the dinner table, at the pool, at the going to the grocery store. I don't care wherever you are, but start becoming more financially literate. That's the only way you're going to make it through this storm. You feel me? As always, I want to thank you for watching Urban Wall Street Project. You can check us out online at urbanwallstreet.tv. Definitely watch and see what we're doing with the young kids at youngproducers.tv. As I always say, keep your head up, be mindful, stay prosperous. Peace.